Right, I think we'll start. So good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on Core Web Vitals. And um, we decided to do a webinar about this a few weeks ago after Google, Google's announcement that this was going to become a ranking signal. And when you get big pre-announcements similar to like the mobile first amount announcement that we had, then they started talking about that in 2016, 2017. There's often sometimes like a, a panicked reaction and some over-dramatization by agencies. So, but yet at the same time, you know, it is a significant statement from them. So just how important is that? And we thought we'd be good to address that and really take you through some of the basics of what core web vitals are, you know, what do you need to know and what sort of action do you need to be considering in taking? So, I'm always interested, you know, we always uh, good to hear what other people think of these announcements when you hear them from Google. So a little bit of a poll to start off with is like, you know, what are your thoughts when Google sent out something like this? What do you think? And we'll leave that running for a while to um, give your answers and we'll come back to that a little bit later on. So, Today's session is going to be around about 45 minutes. We've got two speakers and we'll have some questions in between um, the two speakers. We're going to be recording the webinar and also sharing on a, a slide share. So we'll get those out in the next day or so. So no need to be taking any notes. There is a um, chat function. So feel free to say hi and where you're kind of tuning in from and also a Q&A button at button at the bottom so if you've got any questions at any point feel free to um, you know speak up or type up and we'll do our best to answer those as we go through if we don't get them all to answer them all in between kind of like um, the two speakers or at the end we're going to be putting a blog post together and hopefully we can address those and share those with everyone and finally you know this is our second webinar that we've done we really enjoyed the first one and we got some great feedback and what we want to do is continue improving so afterwards i think there is going to be a survey that'll come around feedback is very very much welcomed uh, and help us keep on improving the kind of info we uh, we give to everyone so today's speakers we've got steve and michael uh, first up is going to be steve who has got considerable SEO experience having worked for Search Labs and Home Agency before joining Spike four years ago. I won't say how many years Steve has been involved in SEO for fear of making him feel old, um, but let's just say he has seen many, many Google updates. I think that's fair to say, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah I remember when, you know, Google just started becoming a player in the search field so uh you know back in the day of infoseek and uh and such but yeah thanks for that rob yeah i think i <clears throat> you're not feeling too old now are you so no. steve heads up our technical seo side of the business uh for spike he'll take you through core web vitals from an seo perspective after that we've got michael michael is the co-founder and director of raindrop Digital, which is a specialist conversion rate optimization agency. Uh, Michael spent a vast amount of time looking at CRO and user experience, and he'll take you through core web vitals from the UX side of things. So there is certainly going to be some overlap, and the two things very much go in hand in hand these days. But you know, it's good to address them both, uh, both very important elements. So we shall get started, and I'll hand you over to Steve and yeah, away you go, Steve. All right, let's see if this is this is handed over well. Um, and uh, technology hasn't failed us. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to, first of all, begin with talking about the core web vitals and why Google has decided to introduce them, because obviously there's a reason behind that, and it's important for us to know it what that means for us as an SEO agency and what it means for our clients and for, for businesses alike. Um, and then I'll just give you a, like a short introduction to each of the um, core web vitals from uh, the loading, 
visual stability and interactivity. Um, okay, it's not moved on yet, Rob, so this has worked well again. Um, yeah, just, just the satellite delay. Between... I'll just carry on pressing buttons frantically. Um, my, my, my but why, has... why are Google introducing um, Core Web Vitals? Um, they came out and they announced this back in May, and it's really about simplifying um, page experience and page speed because there's a lot of clutter when you're you're trying to deal with that it's a very complicated business and i think webmasters developers seo agencies have always struggled with you know where where you should start um and their introduction to that ah here we go so their introduction says yeah we're simplifying the landscape we want to help you focus on what matters the most and i personally think that that's that's a brilliant step forward from Google. It takes away a lot of the lack of clarity around this. Um, just having a look on the, on the graphic on the left-hand side here, they highlight the core web vitals in green for loading, interactivity, and visual stability um, that feed into page experience. But you've also got these other elements like mobile-friendly, safe browsing, and so on. They've not gone away. Okay, so there's still all of those other things that affect where you're going to rank and what Google thinks of your website. But what these core web vitals have really done is take away all of this kind of complexity. Um, this is a report from uh, webpagetest.org um, where Google will send people and say, you know, this will give you a lot of metrics on your website. But where do you start? You know, do you start a first byte? Do you start security score? Um, keep live enabled? You know, all of these different things. And Google have said, okay, we're going to simplify that. We'll bring it down to these three web vitals that are highlighted in the middle here. Um, and that makes our job a lot easier. I think it makes a dev's job a lot easier. Um, and we can, we know where we need to start now. We know what's actually going to have an impact. So that's one of the real benefits to us in, as, as an SEO agency. But what will it mean kind of for, for, for everybody else, for businesses uh, and so forth? Well, we know that these metrics will impact on search rankings. Okay, so initial knee-jerk reaction might be okay panic stations you know what what do we need to fix um you know are we going to get dumped out of the search results um or, or those kind of questions um but i think it's it, you know if i could get across any one message it would be don't panic take a step back from all of this know that it is just one thing that will influence your rankings not necessarily the most you know it isn't the most dominant factor when it comes to seo um but look at it as in, in part of the wider picture google say that they are going to prioritize the pages with the best information and content overall okay so that basically means to me if your website if you're not currently ranking particularly well then you need better content on your website and that is where you should be spending your resources, not on these core web vitals. Okay, they're a focus for a different group of people. If you have really good com uh, content and so does your competitor and you're ranking, you know, you're vying for those top spots in, you know, the top three, and there's nothing to really separate you, then that's when these core web vitals really kick in. So it could mean that you steal that number one spot because you have better core web vitals. Um, but like I said, if your content isn't brilliant in the first place, then this isn't going to change where you rank particularly. Um, in terms of industries that I think it will affect the most, the one that stands out to me, uh, any website that relies heavily on ad revenue because adverts as they load into a website really do interfere with some of the metrics that i'm going to be explaining in a moment um, and that could be difficult to to fix 
I think for any other website, it's a bit like with page speed. If you've been putting efforts into improving your page speed, you will have touched on some of these things in the past anyway. So you, you're probably a bit of a head, ahead of the game. Um, so I'll just take you through now. If it change. So one hour each of these, these core web vitals. And there's three of them. So start off with, we've got largest content for paint. And this to me is kind of like the new page speed, if you like, and it's really simple to understand. Basically, Google, what Google is saying is, we will judge your page on when the biggest item has been loaded and how early you have managed to do that. So in this example, it's kind of a frame by frame loading of a web page. And you can see here at the very last frame, frame five, this image pops into view. And that is the largest element on the page. We're not talking about file size. Um, you know, it, it is simply how much space that it takes up. So it could be text, it could be an image. In this instance, it's an image. So you could judge this website and you could say, okay, by frame five, you have painted the largest item that's available to a user to see. Putting that into some sort of perspective, we've got another example where, again, the, these green highlighted areas that show you the largest piece of content on that page. And you can see here in frame two, you've got a block of text. And that remains the largest item on the page, even as you go into frames three, four, and five, whilst other things are loading in. Um, and so essentially this page, Google would say, okay, you loaded your largest item in frame two. So that's better than frame five. So that's now kind of how they look at page load speed in a way. Um, it's how quickly, you put in your biggest item. Now you can find out on your own website what that largest item is for any given page by using web dev tools in the um, Chrome browser. Um, it will highlight um, the item that is the largest item and you can see when it loads in. And maybe you, you know, like this is a picture of me, am I necessary to this? Should I shrink it down? should I move it elsewhere and we can play about with it um, and, and maybe improve the score for this particular page. Um, so that's largest content for paint. Cumulative layout shift is quite a new one. Um, compared, you know, um, largest content for paint has been around for, for a while. Cumulative layout shift hasn't. It's something that you will all have experienced in the past when you're using the internet um, and this one is I think where adverts fall foul um, of this particular metric quite often. So you can see this is an example of, Google, of uh, the Guardian loading up in my browser. Um, you've got the, the image on the left where you've got this bit of space signed at the top for an advert um, and the browser doesn't know how big how deep that advert is going to be when it's when it's until it's loaded in so on the right hand side you've got the same page but with the advert loaded in and it's shifted all of the other content down so if i was about to click on say news or sport in that navigation suddenly i might find myself clicking on an advert because everything has been shunted down the page and it's these kind of unexpected shifts of content that Google are now judging you on. Um, so like I said, it's quite a new thing. Um, and if your page is bouncing around, you know, these are some of the, the, the sorts of examples that Google will be looking at and scoring you on. Again, you can see that if you use development tools in Chrome, it will show you exactly when these kind of shifts occur. Um, and you can look into what might be causing them and maybe cut that problem out. Now, the last one is first input delay. And you can, you know, you can tell from this is the Google chart um, to try and explain this simply to people and it's instantly fairly complex. Um, 
But in terms of user experience, again, you will all know what this refers to. Um, when you click on a link uh, on a web page and nothing happens, and nothing happens because the browser is busy trying to unpack some JavaScript, trying to render some picture or, or do whatever, but it can't respond to you because it's busy with everything else. Um, and so first input delay is the time between when you click and when the browser becomes available to respond. Um, you can see in web dev tools again, when all of this is occurring, and like I say, it's very technical, it's probably the hardest out of the three metrics to, to actually unpack and make a change to. It's very development heavy, this one. Um, and uh, yeah, the solutions are very complicated as well. So, but really all you need to know in terms of what you're trying to achieve is let's speed up the website. Maybe let's put less JavaScript into the website. Are these things necessary? Can we make it a smoother experience for our users? So leading on from that, where would I start if I had a website um, and was in charge of, yeah, you know, sort of looking into these things? Well, first of all, it's important to know that you've got at least six months notice on this. Google in their release said, um, we will give you six months notice so the earliest it will happen is January, but it's more likely to be later on in the year than that. Um, but this gives you an opportunity to prepare now so you can think, okay, is, is this something where I should be spending my resources? And if it is, then, you know, how, how should I go and start looking? Well, let's start now to see if it's a big problem. And there's various tools that you can use to gain access to the scores for each of your pages on the site. You can use um, this uh, Web Vitals Chrome plugin from the store and any page that you are browsing, it will give you um, a score for each of those metrics. Um, if you've got Google Search Console set up, that has now started reporting on the pages, especially those ones where it thinks that you've got a poor, you're offering a poor user experience. Uh, the Lighthouse reports for page speed, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, that's now built in the web, web vitals into their reports as well. So it's quite easy to find out if your site is suffering with any of these metrics. And then, like I said, you can take a judgment as to whether this should become a priority and you can get a bit of a head start on it before Google rolls it out. So that's kind of a very quick overview of what you could do. If you actually want to sort out a problem, um, then I'll point you in direction of, of this Google video. It's 40 minutes long. It's not for the faint hearted. No, it's very technical. Um, but yeah, if you've got a developer, shove it in their direction. I'm sure they'll thank me for that. Um, but uh, yeah, some really good content on there as to where you could start if you wanted to sort out any of the issues. So that's kind of a you know sort of a whirlwind quick introduction to what Web Vitals are and where I think we stand in terms of SEO. I don't think it's panic stations. I wouldn't want, you know, if somebody was phoning you or emailing you and saying, oh, you've got a terrible score for a core cool web vital, you need to get that sorted out. I think that's probably the wrong reaction to take to these. Yes, they might be important, but you have to put it in context with everything else that's going on on your website. Cool. Um, thank you very much. That's Steve. A uh, couple of questions. Um, first off, you know, there's quite a few businesses and sites out there that have always struggled with page speed and trying to fix their page speed issues. So if they've not been able to do that as page speed, page speed is one metric, will they, will this now be able to fix their issues with like the new metrics? Um, so a bit of both. So that, I think page speed, like I said, it was very difficult to know where to start, what mattered the most, and this helps refine that a bit. I think with 
um, largest content for paint, so the biggest item on your page, that's quite easy to fix. That just needs um, your designer, or, you know, you're just shuffling your template around a little bit, um, and it's not very techy. Um, layout shift is a bit techy, but again, you can maybe say, okay, well, we'll just move things around so it it loads in a better order. Um, when it comes to first input delay, if you got stuck, if you got really stuck with improving your page speed and first input delay you're going to hit the same brick walls with that one. If you've not got access to a good dev team, then yeah, you know, I think you'll really struggle there. So it's a bit of both. I think there are some things that you might have access to as long as you can tweak a template, um, but other things do require a similar amount of dev work as, as page speed used to. Great, thanks. Uh one more question for now, and then I think we might have to address any others uh, just after we've um, had Michael. But from the three core metrics there, are, there a, are they equally important or will one have more impact than the other? Right, that's quite interesting because um, in the old page speed reports, um, they used to give weighted metrics. So things like content paint were rated at a higher value to maybe the time of fully loaded um, and it was all quite complicated. Um, Google haven't said that one will be more important than the other. So that just leads me to believe that, you know, you will you get um, that they will have an equal weighting, um, which again, I think, you know, that means you can't leave first input delay and just abandon that one. You should really work at it as, as well. Um, but as far as I know, these all have equal weighting as metrics. Great, uh, good stuff. Right, I think we'll now move on to, to Michael. Michael's gonna chat to you from a UX perspective. So I'll hand you over to uh, Michael, there's going to be, I think, some some little bits of overlap, but it's always good to uh, make sure we're we're covering from the UX and SEO perspective we mentioned before, because the two things are very closely inter interlinked. So um, over to you, Michael. Brilliant. Thanks, Rob. And as Steve, make sure technology is working. It seems to be skipping ahead with me, so um, I suppose that might be a good thing. Um, anyway, um, afternoon to everyone. So yeah, I'm going to talk through this with more of a UX aspect, but as Rob and Steve have said, this actually intertwines a lot. And with the fact that Google calling it page experience is one where um, it's quite interesting because it still has to work for the user as well as the company. So. I think the main thing here is if you're already striving to improve your website, you do have nothing to fear, but it's all too easy to think, right, I'll get some better scores and the user experience is going to be better. But a lot of companies struggle with bloated code bases, legacy systems that actually helps them really struggle, I suppose, um, striving to improve. Um, and that's one thing that these scores will never get you away from. Um, so it's one where it's got to work for the user basically. But what does it actually mean in your efforts from a UX side? Well, I do actually believe it's a positive step. Um, a usable site works better for customers and converts better. The website doesn't fundamentally work. The chances of actually understanding the user is difficult. So if things that Google are trying to make people address here stopping a user from using the website then you're never actually going to get underneath the user enough to find out what the further problems with your website are um, but also as google is sort of trying to point out here as well is you can have the best design and content but if people actually can't use the website then there's going to be no difference and it's going to affect on both sides Yep, and as usual, nice bit of technical uh, skipping. So before we actually get into it further, one thing that I always talk with clients about is the core foundations. Um, the issue um, can be here is when things are announced, 
right, we'll have to start changing things on the website. But I would say it needs to go back to basics where you need to have a defined process about how you're actually going to make the website better. Um, listen to customers. If we don't utilize customer feedback as part of the process, then even though these are, are could potentially um, impact you from a ranking point, um, they still could be opinion-based changes and they might not be the core problems of the website. And then the last thing is make the product and website as usable as possible. If it's not usable, customer satisfaction will lower and you won't make as much revenue or get enough leads through the door. Every time I press it, it seems to uh, do two slides at once. <laughs> so um, as Steve did, I was just going to break these down as what we would class these from the UX side. So large content will pay, load time, how long does the main content to appear for the user, first input delay, page interactivity, time from user interacting with an element, say a link or a button. One key metric here to understand is this doesn't include scrolling. So if someone hits the website and scrolls, they won't class that as page interactivity. And lastly is cumulative layout shift, which uh, our class is page stability, with expected and unexpected shifts to the page. So we're gonna start with load time. So there are many statistics out there of how improving load time will increase conversions, a certain percentage of conversions will increase with each second you shave off. Um, but actually, with a lot of clients we've worked with, when we've looked at page speed, it's actually been a case by case basis because sometimes you can get to a point of diminishing returns with load time, which is where trying to tie it to revenue all the time can be quite tough. Um, you know, sometimes getting from three seconds to two seconds or two seconds to one second could actually cost quite a lot of money and a lot of times the company and there may be other issues from the user experience side um, that are higher or got higher weighting. Um, what I would say is though is the best way of measuring load time is looking at it from a point of view of how long you can retain users on your website. If you take e-commerce for example, users can have multiple sessions on, on the site before they consider a purchase. If the site is slow, then that could impact them coming back. So it's all about retaining them for longer and improving their experience at the same time. That's why Google in a lot of their tests and their industry benchmark, they've been using probability of bounce, which again is something in your analytics, which is um, key to keep an eye on. I wouldn't report on it as a, a key metric, but I would use it as an indicator. Um, and from Google's viewpoint, the higher the time it takes to load, the probability of bounce is massively increasing. So it's something to definitely look at from that perspective. Um, when it comes to load time, there is a lot of different aspects that we want to really look at. Um, and the scores don't always reflect what some of the problems are. Um, I've got some examples that I'll talk through, but you know, if you're going to start looking at improving load time from a user experience perspective and from a business perspective, then you've got to look at your hosting provider and what resources you've got. If the site can't scale, um, then the scores won't reflect that. Secondly, um, it's all to do with how the site's been built. So is it cached? Have you got the right database functions in place? Have you optimized your images? and have you minified JavaScript and CSS? These are all key things that will help improve load time, not just on a scoring basis, but on a basis for the user as they're using the site. So I've got an example here of one client we were working with. And when we first looked at the website, speed was a massive issue, as you can tell from the screenshots. Um, the actual full load time was 21 seconds, um, which is, you'd be probably thinking, why are people still sticking around? Um, and that was a major case. Um, this test, or the, the time we did this, was pre when the Web Vitals had been introduced. Um, so I've actually done pre and post improvements. So when we actually started changing that site, um, 
we actually realised that it wasn't all down to the code base. It was actually due to how the server was configured. So by reconfiguring the server, um, we actually halved the load time of this website. But the interesting thing is now that the core web vitals have been introduced, it's now given us the next point of how we can actually improve that website. And the major area here is the largest contentful paint. You can see that is quite, still quite high. By improving that, we would actually believe the total load time will come down um, massively. Um, the main issue with the site as well is images. So as I mentioned before, if we can get those images compressed and that will help with the contentful paint because they are the largest elements of the website. But the second thing that the scores don't always tell you is what it actually does for the user when you're on the website. So this is one of our other clients with their checkout and as the website loads, it actually gives people error messaging around the fields and actually around the shipping methods. And this is something where, as I said before, it's a case by case basis. You've got to actually work through the site as a user would and see what the issues are because when this happens this was actually causing issues for users thinking oh i can't get my product shipped when the website did load it actually provided ship methods so this is one where it's something that i wouldn't panic about scores all the time but actually really use the website as a user because in this case we realized that error messaging was appearing before users were actually given the information. So the load time needs to improve in the checkout and those error messages need to disappear. Um, so this is actually where it would affect the customer's experience, but also it's something that I would say a scoring system wouldn't actually pick up. So these are the things to actually really start to look for once you start to look at these areas. So that's about load time. The next one I'm going to discuss is page interactivity. And as Steve said, this is actually the hardest one, A, to measure, but B, to look at how you can impact it. Um, this is looking at how long it takes the browser to load from when a user interacts with the page. And the main factor of this will actually be JavaScript. And it's one where you would want to work with your developers to see how much JavaScript the website is loading and if any of that is causing issues. You can actually see for yourself with the example Steve said, but in another way, when you load uh, a website, you can see in the bottom corner of your browsers, usually a little black line with different things that are loading and that can actually be external scripts. So another thing to look for to help with this area is to audit all the tags that are on your website. Um, we see it many times. The, there's a lot of third party tags that can be causing page interactivity issues. Some of these will be valid and will be needed um, from a tracking perspective, but we usually find out of date tags or tags that are still there, but the software doesn't even have a subscription with the business anymore and is still being loaded. So that's an extra resource. So one thing I'd recommend from a page interactivity aspect is looking at what tags are loading and what can be reduced and that will be a good start point and it will help on that area. And then the next area we're actually going to look at is page stability which I actually believe is the biggest impact from the user experience side. Um, this is all about what the user sees and changes in stability can be very frustrating for users. Um, it can be harmful, it can also increase frustration and friction for users and it's not always just about when they land on the website, it's actually as they navigate through the website and use it. So the main thing here is we should also on always consider how an element changes on the website from when a user interacts with it. And when the content shifts unexpectedly or abruptly, take the example mega menus or full screen searches. When we see on a lot of sites now, you click a search icon, all of a sudden a full screen search appears and it actually blocks the screen for the user. These can create poor experiences. And I again, wouldn't say these are ones that would 
come up as part of scoring, but actually come up as part of usability issues. So this is where it all has a knock on effect. And this is where from a UX side, actually using the website, using heat maps and video recordings is something that would help you identify all of these and make the experience better. So what are the common issues from the page stability side? So as you saw from Steve's examples, um, ads, embeds and iframes are probably the biggest problems here. Um, loading videos from Vimeo, YouTube, um, ad roll, things like that. But there's other areas of how stability can be effective. So you have got images without dimensions. So when a website loads and then a big hero image comes in last and then shifts all the page down, that is actually one of the biggest problems. And that can affect quite a lot of websites that are image heavy. Um, the other area also is dynamic content, which is actually injected over other content or as screen overlays. These can be things like when you see pop-ups appear for sign up to a newsletter, um, telling people to install an app or GDPR notices. One thing I would say is try to limit the amount of times you can say to new content when the page is loading or when a user is interacting and make sure that any layout shifts that occur are expected when the user initiated a certain action on the website. I've got some examples of this, of how this is happening at the moment and where certain ministries can get affected by it. So the first one, um, this is actually a online, what I call online magazine blog style website. And um, they do rely massively on ads as their revenue stream. But as you can see on the left hand side, this is what the website looks like when it loads. And then about two or three seconds later, a huge banner ad starts appearing behind. We also get a banner ad under the navigation and we get banner ads down the right hand side. All of a sudden, the page is completely shifted from a stability angle. And websites that rely on these kind of ads, I believe, will get hit further and it will harm them from a UX side just as much as a search side. And it's an area where, from an ad perspective, these need factoring in or the lookups need to be better for when the website loads. The experience can be very poor and actually drive people away from the core of the website, which is to read the content. The next one that I'm going to use as an example is pop-ups, as I mentioned earlier. This was a Econ site we were working on and they were using very heavy pop-ups throughout the journey as people were using the website. And we were seeing from heat maps and video recordings that this was unexpected layout shifts because as people were trying to use the basket, they were getting pop-ups which weren't always relevant this was harming usability massively and actually harming conversion rates so again this is areas where sometimes the, the speed tools might not always pick these up but from a ux side it's things to definitely be looking out for um, because it's one where it will impact how people move through the journey same client but in a different aspect this was actually something that we believe is something that the speed tools don't pick up which is expected layout shifts which is where usability comes in again so the aim of this website is to get someone to upload a photo um, as you go to upload a photo um, what happens is the screen goes black and it just says you're having trouble use our simple uploader the user doesn't actually know what's happening on the website even though it's an expected layout shift that something was going to happen they haven't been given any progress indicators or anything here to help them understand what's happening next. And this is something where I believe Google do need to look at how they're um, scoring sites because expected layout shifts are something that cause usability problems when not done properly. And that's something that I think they need to factor in, in the future, but it's something that you can pick up from studying how users are using your website and is sometimes actually a quicker fix and somewhere that can massively help improve the experience. And then 
one of the other examples I'm going to give here is a checkout, which I believe when we were doing the studies on this website and now looking at how the core web vitals are introduced is an unexpected layout shift as well as a usability issue. Um, when we were studying the site from a heat map perspective, we could see that there was quite a large amount of taps on the shipping method, as well as the next button, the checkout. When you actually look at the website, the shipping method is already checked. Um, so we are wondering why are people tapping on this instead of just hitting the button and moving forward. And what actually was happening was when people were clicking the button, the website was reloading and giving error messages saying that no one had selected their delivery method. And the issue around this was that when that happened, the website unexpectedly shifted people to the top of the page. There was no inline errors to say why this was a problem, um, but also it was stopping people from checking out. So again, these are examples, but they're all part of a whole journey of where the core web vitals actually need to be taken into account at each step of the journey. And it's something that it's just a speed test tool or using tools like that isn't always going to pick these up. So this is where using heat maps, using video recordings is a way of finding them. So how do we find these usability problems? Well, the first thing I would do is look at the analytics data, look at what your low performing pages are, where your high drop off points of those are, then set up heat maps and video recordings for these areas. Marrying that with the results you get from core web vitals will help you understand the initial aspects of how the page is loading and you can marry that with finding insights from heat maps and video recordings. I would then recommend them taking user feedback through surveys and polls and trying to get some user testing in place with moderated groups to actually see how they are using the website and making notes at the same time. All of this will, will be a defined process and you'll be able to listen to your customers at the same time, which help you make the website usable and more user friendly. There are plenty of tools on the market at the moment. Um, some of these are very low cost, depending on the size of your website. So you'd be able to use Google Analytics, you'd be able to use SurveyMonkey and Typeform from a survey perspective. Hotjar will help you run heat maps, video recordings, surveys and polls. Session Cam will allow you to do session recording or video recordings. Crazy Egg will do heat maps and they've launched A-B testing. And then from a testing perspective, um, you can use Optimize VWO um, from an A-B split testing perspective, or you could use Usability Hub for doing remote user testing. Again, prices vary with these tools. Um, we're not affiliated to any of them, but they are the ones we use across the board when it comes to finding user problems and fixing them on the website. So they're ones that I would recommend getting going on your site and marrying this with core web vitals. And really the next steps, um, plan for these changes now. Um, like Steve said, it's not something I would say panic, but it should be something that should be factored into your process. Um, the first thing that I would actually do as part of all of this is actually speak with customer service teams. They're speaking with customers daily. They collate so much information and that can be a gold mine of knowledge to help research where there is some assumptions of issues on the website. Um, I would use the tools to test for issues. So I use the Car Web Vitals tools to highlight the baseline or basics. Um, and then from there, I would then undertake user research to uncover usability problems. And then following this, involve your dev, dev team early. Um, some of this actually will involve a lot of code changes. So getting them in early, discussing it with them, it will make the whole process run smooth. So hopefully that's helpful for everyone. And um, that's everything that I'll be discussing today. Uh, great stuff. Thank, thanks that, Michael. So I think a couple of questions. One of the things you mentioned was the probability of bounce. And yeah. um, you said that was something to be used as a KPI 
um, and not as probably as a standalone metric. <clears throat> Google reports now. Where where can people find that score? Should they want to find out what it is? So basically, in Google Analytics, it's bounce rate, um, and also looking at time on site. Um, but you, you can see it in many reports, but one of the better areas to look at is either landing pages um, and that's the area really because you get to see from an individual page aspect when people land, are they having one session and disappearing or are they staying on for longer? So that's where I would look first. Um, cool, good, good stuff. Um, Steve, probably a, um, a question that I'll put to both of you really is Helen's asked, how does lazy loading affect largest contentful paint? So, um, and either of you, go for it. Yeah. Um, sorry, do, do you want to answer this one, Michael? Or? Uh, yeah, it'll to you, yeah, yeah, I can answer to you, yeah. It's, uh, it's actually a really good question. And that said, any other questions aren't, but it's one way everyone tells you to oh, put lazy loading on improves uh, speed. I think it actually boils back to is it the largest item on the page um, if it's not I wouldn't say it would have a huge effect but it also comes back to the way lazy loading has been implemented and if you set the image dimensions for each image accurately then lazy loading I believe wouldn't have an effect I don't know what you think about that Steve I think um, <clears throat> the problem with lazy load is that it's been lazily implemented in, in a lot of ways. So lazy load should really only affect content um, that is loading into the page, but below what you instantly get to see on the page. So you've, you've got your, your mobile view um, and everything that's downloading that you can scroll to see should only load in as the user scrolls to see it. Quite often when we see lazy load implemented, it just is applied to all images. So it basically says, load in all your images last. Um, and, and that's not going to help you when it comes to largest content full paint, because if your LCP is an image and you've told the browser to load in images last, then you're actually going to perform worse. In, in that situation um, and you need a bit more control over loading that top image in um, quicker um, and, and not applying lazy load just to every single image that's that's on the page um, so yeah that might that might cause some problems for websites I think who have done the right thing by applying lazy load but maybe not quite in the right way Okay, great, thanks. Another question has been asked a couple of times, I think, is regarding first input delay, um, would it be classed as interactivity if someone scrolls and then clicks a button? Uh, no, oh, when they click the button is, is the time that is recorded um, from, so, and like I say, it's that delay from, clicking a button and something happening so it's not like you need somebody to try and interact with your page straight away um, you know you're not being scored on that somebody came to my website and two seconds later they clicked on something and and so i win um, it's it's basically when somebody does choose to click how quickly does that browser respond um, it's a difficult one to measure because you get, you know, any use, it's all independent, really. Um, it it's, all comes back to how the user interacts and every user is different and will click on different things in a different time scale. So it's quite a difficult one to measure. It needs real world use um and to build that up over time to actually identify where you've got problems and i think you know the stuff that michael's gone through in terms of actual user testing and understanding what's going on is how or one of the ways that you kind of approach this problem um but yeah scrolling for some reason doesn't 
doesn't count as an interaction with the page at all. Okay, thanks. A uh, couple more um, really good questions. What one caller who um, said, how do you feel pop-ups will be judged, expected or not expected? For example, uh, in email sign up on exit. So if you hover over the top of the browser, you're about to leave, you'll get a, often get a pop-up for an email sign up, which is a, which pop-ups are a good point in general. So, um, what's <laughs> And and they made yeah. it here, so um, yes, yeah. Um, uh, do you want to go first? Yeah, I would say any time where it is not click orientated, then it's unexpected, um, and I think that's where that comes in. So, like you, you example you get there, Rob. Uh, you're about to ban on the website, and something pops up. That is technically unexpected because you haven't clicked anything. Um, Whereas if it was part of a process where you click a button and a modal window pops up, that could be an expected um, layout shift of the page. I think one of the biggest problems here really is, and I think it doesn't help with the way cookie banners have been implemented, but when you first land on a website and all of a sudden you have this massive pop-up in front of you asking you loads of different options. Um, we've actually seen it in heat maps where what we class as my banner blindness where people just completely ignore it because they expect it now and just delete it and don't read it so it actually has other effects from the ux side but um i would say if it's not user operated it's unexpected anything to add to that steve yeah i think just going back to the the first graphic by i had in my slides and i think michael had it in his as well um, which highlighted, yeah, we've got these core web vitals, but we've also got mobile friendly site, HTTPS. And the last one on that list was intrusive interstitials. So they're separate from core web vitals. Um, they're already in play in that sense. So if you've got something, when somebody goes to your homepage and you just slap up a big, banner that's promoting something before a user has even had the opportunity to you know browse around your site for a little bit um, then it's probably impacting your rankings right now and and something that i would suggest fixing um, so yeah it does it does affect what google thinks of your page experience um, but it's not truly related to core web vitals it's its own separate issue um, that they have highlighted for people. Thanks. Uh, two more questions again because they keep coming in so um, we've got a bit more time so the one from Andrew Jacobs, uh, what's the best way to avoid massive delays with marketing tracking? Oh the holy grail. <laughs> <laughs> As you obviously on many speed tests this comes up quite a lot. Um, there isn't a finite answer to this from uh, from one side, but you can prefetch, um, which is basically the website does like DNS lookups a lot quicker to pull these tracking tags through. But another way is depending the way the tags work, you can host them locally and load them locally to the server, which is one where... Um, you would have to really work with your dev team to make sure it doesn't have an impact. That is the best way, but it might not be the right way depending on the tag you put in. I think the other side is actually just reviewing what marketing tracking tags you're loading on the site and how necessary they all are. Um, and also the efficiency of, of them because we've seen it with sites where people have put their Facebook pixel code on three or four times um actually do you only need it once so i think it's there's like a halfway house really of how much do you need can you save it locally or can you prefetch it don't know if you've got anything on that steve yeah it, it comes into the the sort of first input delay thing i think with how how busy a browser is trying to deal with all of those tags and all of those scripts um i'm by no means an expert in uh, what is called web workers, um, but I've been reading up of them uh, of late. I think the whole sort of prefetch thing is is good. 
Um, web workers are, so the complication with the browser is that it's dealing with kind of one thread and everything queues up on that one thread and, and therefore delays things. And web workers, from my understanding, gives you a second thread. So you can actually split that load and have multiple things working at the same time. So whilst you might not be able to necessarily reduce the amount of scripts that you're running, you can maybe take some off the, the main thread, the main browser workload and share it around to, to other threads um, and just speed up the whole process like that. But again, that's me kind of having researched it a bit and got out of my depth in, uh, in some technical server code and thinking, okay, well, I need to, need to carry on reading up about that. But, you know, it's certainly an option if you've got dev time uh, and the resources to back that up. Your bedtime reading sounds pretty wild, Steve. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, couple more. So... Another one from Helen is, if you've got an article which has images all the way through it, would the text as a whole count as the LCP or would each block of text count individually? It's, it's individual. So it, it pretty much comes down to like your paragraph tags in HTML. Um, so it could be as small as a, as a you know, your title, be an LCP and it's simply on how much space that that takes up but your title is um, surrounded by the title tags you know, your h1 headings or whatever um, counts as a separate element to the paragraph that might come below it so, um, so each one of those bits uh, will be individual I think just to add to that as well is paragraph length more from a usability side as well like long paragraphs on articles can be very um, difficult for users especially users that are dyslexic as well so I think it's one where um, shorter paragraphs and, and laying a blog out in a better way will actually help this as well so again it intertwines so much. Okay great one, one final question which is uh, come from Duncan, who is a fellow director here at Spike, who's asking you to get crystal balls here out, guys, and um, and to say, do you think Google will add more components to Core Web Vitals over time, and what things might they be able to phase in? <laughs> you want to just ignore him? You can ignore him if you want. I'll, I'll take a shot of that one first. I think, um, you know, these things change. We've had page speed um, and, and everything that came along with that. Um, I think one of the problems will be, you know, like I started off saying, I think they've done a really good job here of simplifying what we need to look at once you get your head around these web vitals. You've got a really clear starting point to then go and attack your website and make it better for users. Um, so yes, Google could come along in another year's time and say we've just added another three, but then they are making it more complex again, you know, and you get you might as well just go back partly to, to the old scheme of things. I think they will add things over time, but I need to be quite delicate with that, otherwise they sort of undo all the good that they're doing with this. And I do think that it's, you know, it's a good direction to take because so many clients that we've seen over the years have just hit that brick wall with page speed. And it's very difficult to justify them making another investment in, you know, time to first bite or something like that, because you don't know how significant that that will be as a as an impact um so narrowing down that focus i think helps out everybody and hopefully improves page experience for all everybody's users so will they add something not for a while you know be very disappointed in google if next year they come out with another three uh, you know uh, we'll, we'll do another webinar about it then and i will be angry so. <laughs> well, we don't want to make you angry, Steve. And that's not what we want. 
Any, anything for um, Michael? It is, it is a difficult yeah. question to end on. Yeah, it's a very difficult question, but it's one where I agree with what Steve said. Hopefully they don't add anything else. This is simplifying it, but my only worry is the more they try and add or the more they say this is page experience. We have a a worry in the industry that people will say, right, well, I've got largest content for paint really low, human layout shift is low, um, page interactivity is good. They'll think the website is absolutely perfect then when really a website is never perfect. User behavior changes all the time. And this is something where Google are trying to help people understand that further, but this is just the start really. And the only thing I think that I would like to see them add is things to do with you know, expected layout shifts as well as unexpected really. Um, because at the moment everything's concentrated on unexpected. Um, I do know that their bots are now trying to go through sites, especially from a Google shopping perspective, uh, adding products to basket, which is quite interesting. So maybe there's stuff that comes out about that from an e-com side, but there's that many different industries and websites. I think it's going to be very hard to add more without overcomplicating it. Cool. Great stuff. Right, thank you very much for your time, guys, and, and the efforts putting that together have been, been great. And yeah, everyone, thanks for taking the time to um, tune into this. Hopefully you found that useful. We'll be sending out all the slides and various things over the next um, couple of days. But by all means, get in touch, um, drop us an email or, or any questions you've got um, after this, and we'll be happy to help where we can. So thank you very much. Have a good evening. And um, yeah, take care. Thanks. We all ended. Yeah.